can you can you see my slides and hear me all right yeah fine perfect um, yeah, thank, thank you very much for, for that kind introduction and thank you so much for giving me the chance to, to speak here. Um, I joined last year's winter conference um, to give an EDI talk and I'm, I'm very excited and delighted to share some of, some of my chemistry with you this year. Um, much like everybody else, the, the last two years have been very difficult for our group in terms of research, so it's been absolutely great to have these online events to um, to not lose touch with the with the research community, um, and and much like um, Professor Shute, I'm I'm sorry that I can't be there in person, um, but I'm very much looking forward to hopefully meeting some of you in, in person very soon. So my um, my research talk, and I'm just going to get a laser pointer out there. Um, my my research talk is is going to be about catalysis for for late stage functionalization. Um, which really summarizes the research interests in, in my research group. What we look at is using cheap and easily available starting materials, ideally waste products from, from the chemical industry, um, and transform those, build up the, the molecular and, and the structural complexity that's necessary for high value products. And the way we do this is by using catalysis and new reagents um, to form interesting bonds within those molecules, hoping that get, this gives us a cost efficient, atom efficient, um, sustainable way of building up this molecular complexity. The work that I'm going to talk to you about today is work that I carried out during my postdoc. Um, this was in the research group of Professor Kiri Engel at the Scripps Research Institute in California. And then very briefly at the end of my talk, I'm going to expand how we're going to use those insights gained from, from this project um, to some of the exciting new research that I'm going to be starting in, in my independent research group. So one of the readily available cheap building blocks in, in chemistry that we can work with are alkenes. And the question that, that Kiri Engels lab, one of the questions that, that they focus on is how can we selectively transform these alkenes? How can we functionalize them to build up some of the complexity that I just that I just mentioned. And if we think back to our undergraduate lectures, we know that if we functionalize an alkene, for example, with a nucleophile, the regiochemistry of the product <clears throat> is really controlled by the sterics and the electronics of the starting materials we start with. So if we have an unactivated alkene on the left-hand side here, and we react this with a, with a protic nucleophile, we get Markovnikov addition, which goes via the most stable carbocation intermediate. We get protonation, we form um, a stabilized secondary carbocation here, and, and that's where the nucleophile then, then attacks. And if we have an activated alkene, a Michael acceptor over here, and react that with the nucleophile, then once again, we go via the more stable intermediate, which in this case is a, a st stabilized carb anion, um, to, to form this product that, that we're showing over here on the right hand side. And the question we asked ourselves was, can, can we take an alkene, can we functionalize it under metal catalysis, and can we get very nice um, selective regio control that we can control depending on the, on the reaction conditions we use? Now, obviously, we're not the we weren't the first group to, to think about this, and I've added a couple of seminal um, reports down here using palladium chemistry because that's the that's the transition metal that we'll be focusing on in this talk. Um, but obviously, there's a lot of activity in in this um, in this area, and um, I apologise if I if I've missed out any important references there. So the approach that we took to this selective metal catalyzed functionalization of alkenes was a directing group approach. In other words, we add a coordinating directing group to our substrate, um, which is very good at forming a chelate with the palladium 2 catalyst that we use. Um, so the directing group coordinates to the palladium and brings that palladium into close proximity of the reactive center, in this case, the alkene. The palladium acts as a Lewis acid activator. It coordinates to the double bond and withdraws electron density from the pi system here, making the alkene very reactive towards nucleophiles. 
we get nucleophilic attack on this activated alkene and the site of attack, so the regioselectivity of our functionalization is determined by the formation of a stable palatocycle. And I'll talk a little bit more about what makes a palatocycle stable and, and unstable in the following slides. This palladium intermediate can now be um, functionalized in, in various different ways. We could imagine doing um, an oxidative addition with, with an electrophile, oxidizing the palladium up to palladium four and then getting reductive elimination. Or in the simplest of cases, we can think about protonating off this palladium, uh, this carbon palladium bond. So adding an external proton source, an acid, to get protonation of this bond, which is quite similar to um, the way that, for example, a, a Grignard reagent reacts with, with water or any other proton source. And this then gives us selectively our hydrofunctionalized products. At the point where I joined uh, Curie Engel's group, and I'm just going to move my face out of the way here in case you can see that as well. Um, at the point where I joined Curie Engel's group, uh, the, the group had developed various different, uh, very effective ways of doing this hydrofunctionalization on these uh, uh, butanoic acid derivatives. And the directing group that they used was adaminoquinoline that I've showed in, in green here. This is um, a very common directing group that's used in CH activation and, and transition metal catalysis. So they were able to get very high yields and, and very good selectivities on these transformations uh, using the catalytic cycle that I, that I just explained to you. And the question we asked ourselves when I joined the group was, can we make a very small change to our starting material? Instead of having one CH2 linker, one methylene linker here, um, can we change the substrate to have a slightly longer carbon chain um, to have two methylene linkers, uh, sorry, a, a, a two CH2 linker in here? And the reason we were interested in, in, in doing this is to expand the substrate scope of different alkenes that we can functionalize using this methodology. I, I just told you that our goal is to build up as much molecular complexity as we can, and we want to do this on as many different um, substrate as, substrates as we can to, to make the reaction as useful to the synthetic community as possible. So this was the question we asked ourselves. Can we make a small change to the starting material and still get this very nice selective transformation? And the short answer to that is, it's not as straightforward as that. We, we can't just translate this methodology one-to-one -to, -one to a new substrate like this um, to, the, to the pentanoic acid derivatives. If we try this, then what we see is we only get about 11% of the desired product. And instead we see quite high levels of alkene isomerization. So in this case, the terminal alkene has isomerized to the more stable internal alkene and we get hydrofunctionalization across that and beta hydride elimination. And really that's not very surprising at all because I told you on the previous slide that the regiochemistry of this nucleophilic attack really depends on the stability of the palatocycle that we're forming. And it's well known in the literature that five-membered palatocycles, this is the intermediate um, via which we go in the successful transformation that, that I've shown you up here. We know that five-membered palatocycles are stable, relatively stable, they are quite rigid, and importantly, they don't undergo competing beta hydride elimination, which allows us to get this very high selectivity of the hydrofunctionalized product. Conversely, we also know from the literature that six-membered palatocycles this is what we're trying to force the system into by adding an extra methylene linker on our carbon skeleton here. We know that six-membered intermediates are quite flexible. Um, they're, they're relatively floppy if we use colloquial terms. Um, they're therefore not very stable because they undergo very, very fast beta hydride elimination. And that's the process that we're competing with here. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to design a new directing group that would allow us to stabilize these six-membered palatocycle intermediates enough that we can outcompete the beta hydride elimination and the isomerization reactions and therefore access these desired um, hydrofunctionalization reactions. 
How did we go about doing this? Well, mechanistically, we know that the very first step that we see in a beta hydride elimination is an agostic interaction between the carbon hydrogen bond. Um, this is the hydrogen that's going to eliminate in the beta hydride elimination step. An agostic interaction between, between this carbon hydrogen bond and a vacant site on the palladium, on the metal catalyst. We also knew from previous mechanistic studies in the group that this vacant site on the metal was not necessary to access our desired products. So our thought process was the following. Can we design a new tridentate directing group, taking inspiration from tridentate pincer ligand systems? Can we design a new tridentate directing group that would block this vacant site on the metal center? The hope was that if we block this vacant site on the metal center, we block this agostic interaction and therefore suppress beta hydride elimination. And our hope was that that would stabilize the six member Pallada cycle enough that we can um, access these desired hydrofunctionalized process uh, products so that we can run through the, the catalytic cycle that I've, that I've discussed in the previous slide um, without getting beta hydride elimination um, side reactions here. We started our um, directing group design by thinking about some of the most common bidentate directing groups that are used in, in transition metal catalysis, and then thinking about how we can modify those to get a third um, coordination site that can coordinate to our palladium and block that vacant site that we, that we don't want um, because we want to avoid the beta hydride elimination. Just a very brief note, um, if, if you're not very familiar with directing group chemistry, the choice of directing group can be crucial to determine your reaction outcome. And um, I'm trying to demonstrate that here by just showing you the outcome of using two very common bidentate directing groups that are, that are known in the literature, um, Dargoulis's adaminoquinoline and Xi's PIP directing group. And you can already see, um, despite the fact that they're structurally quite similar, we've got the nitrogen coordination sites for the, for the palladium here, a relatively simple, uh, similar carbon backbone. The results that we get in our reaction are, are quite different. So we knew that we'd have to, um, we'd have to hit the jackpot in terms of um, the sterics that we design into our directing group and also the electronics. So we started with this amino quinoline directing group um, and we started coupling it to amino acids to get this third um, coordination site for the palladium to get three, um, three coordination sites that can coordinate to our palladium catalyst. And what we found, sorry, let me just very quickly um, talk you through the reaction scheme up here. So this is our starting material with the directing group, DG is short directing group attached to it. Um, we use the standard reaction conditions that had previously been developed in the group. I'll talk about which kind of nucleophiles we used in a second. This is the product that we were hoping to achieve, and we want to avoid isomerization of the double bond to the, to the more stable internal double bond. We want to avoid hydrofunctionalization of this internal double bond, and we also want to avoid um, beta hydride elimination. So when we when we designed these new tridentate directing groups with the with the amino acid scaffold, what we found was that we very nicely suppressed formation of these beta hydride elimination products. Um, but we did still see quite a bit of um, quite a bit of double bond isomerization. So this, on the one hand, was promising because it indicated that maybe our idea of blocking that vacant site to suppress beta hydride elimination was um, was valid, um, but we weren't able to, to, to suppress the formation of the internal double bond, so alkene isomerization, isomerization, which can then go via a five-member Pallada cycle to, to give us these products. So we thought about doing taking a new approach, and I should say the, the two students who helped me with this part of the, of the project were two PhD students in the group um, at the time, Ray and, and John. Um, John did a lot of work on these, on these amino acid um, derivatives. And then uh, Ray looked at a, a different type of directing group where, again, we take the eight amino quinoline scaffold um, and then add another heteroaromatic to, to get this third coordination site for the, for the palladium catalyst. And what we found with this series was uh, we got 
nice suppression of the beta hydride elimination in, in some cases, not, not in all cases. Um, we got very nice suppression of um, alkene isomerization, again, in, in some cases, but, but not in all cases. But most importantly, what we found was that we really had to get the balance right between um, the, the, the coordinate coordination strength, right? So we want a directing group that is strong enough to coordinate to our palladium, suppress our beta hydride elimination and allow us to access these products. But at the same time, the directing group also has to be able to let go of the palladium catalyst again. We can't generate um, basically a, a pincer ligand that's so strong, it holds onto the palladium and doesn't let go of it anymore, because in that case, we're, we're poisoning our catalytic cycle. The palladium can only do uh, one one transformation, and we don't get very high yields of the of the desired products. We can see that in in the case up here, where we've got a very strong um, strongly coordinating thi thiophene site, and we found that the the Goldilocks balance between coordination strength, but which should be strong enough but not too strong, was when we added a, a pyridine to our eight amino quinoline. We saw very nice suppression of both the beta hydride side reaction and the um, the isomerization reaction and obviously nice stabilization of our six-membered um, palata cycle to give us the desired pro products. And that to us was, was a really exciting point in the project where we found that our hypothesis seems to be, seems to be working, it seems to be right. Um, and if, if you're ever, ever interested in, in doing these kind of transformations using tridentate directing groups, um, they are available commercially on, on Merck or, or Sig Sigma Aldridge. So what this gives us now is a tridentate directing group that allows us to extend the substrate scope that, that I just told you about. And in the next slide, I just want to talk a little bit about the, the, the substrate scope that we were able to achieve. Um, I, I promised you I'd show you some of the nucleophiles that we used. Um, what we're doing here is, is carbo hydrofunctionalization, um, adding activated carbon nucleophiles across this double bond. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Um, a couple of things that I'd like to point out is we confirmed the structure of our products by, by X-ray crystallography. We were able to add various different um, stabilized carbon nucleophiles across our double bonds, um, forming some, some interesting quaternary stereocenters, albeit in, in, in very low yields. Um, we were able to use linear double bonds, but also um, internal cyclic double bonds, again, in, in lower yields here and using more forcing conditions. Um, we developed both acidic and basic conditions, which was quite interesting when we used Meldrum's acid as the, as the nucleophile, because under basic conditions, we saw incorporation of the entire nucleophile, whereas under acidic conditions, um, we saw um, hydrolysis and then decarboxylation to get an introduction of this, of this carboxylic acid moiety. Um, but in general, what you can see for all of these nucleophiles is that all of them have a hydroxy group next to the reactive center. So we always need this alpha hydroxy group for the, for the reaction to work. Um, we tried various different other nucleophiles that didn't have this alpha hydroxy group and didn't see any reaction with them. And that's already um, an interesting point that, that I'll come back to when I talk about the, the mechanism of this reaction. But importantly, what I'm showing on this slide is that our, our hypothesis of the tridentate directing group design um, seemed to seem to work really well here. We can take these pentanoic acid derivatives and go via the six-member palata cycle intermediate to get hydrofunctionalization of the double bond. And as I said, we were, we were quite excited about this. We then wanted to extend the substrate scope even further, looking at not only carboxylic acid derivatives, but also amine derivatives. Um, we designed a whole new directing group for, for these kind of uh, substrates. And I, was, um, I, got, I got some great support by Josh Turnbull, who at the time was an undergraduate student at, at King's College London and had come to the lab for a, for a summer internship. So he did a lot of work on designing this, this alternative tridentate directing group for amine um, substrates. And again, I'm not going to spend too much time here. The substrate scope was very similar to, to the one we saw on the previous slide, going via these six-membered palata cycles to give us the hydrofunctionalized products here. 
Um, interestingly, this was the only case where we tried a nuclear file that didn't have this um, alpha hydroxy group and, and actually got some, some reasonable yields with this, with this N-methyl indole nuclear file, which, which was quite interesting. So with these two directing groups in hand, we can now do something really interesting. We can now take an alkene substrate, something like this, um, this amino acid derivative, that has two different functional groups in it, a carboxylic acid functional group and an amine functional group. And because we've designed these two different directing groups, we can now get regiodivergent alkene functionalization. So um, where are we? There we are. We can control the attack of the nucleophile on um, either the, the terminal or the internal site of the alkene, depending on which direct, directing group we attach to this molecule. So if we attach a directing group to the carboxylic acid moiety, we get attack at the terminal position, as can be seen here. And if we attach the directing group to the amine moiety instead, we get attack at the, at the internal position, as we can see here, in, in relatively high yields. And importantly, we're conserving the stereochemical information in, in the starting material here. So that to us, it really shows the power of, of designing these different directing groups that by simply choosing a different directing group and attaching that to your molecule, you can control the selectivity of your functionalization reaction using the same starting material, but a different directing group. Um, that's all well and good in a system where really we can only go via the, the six member polar cycle. We were also interested in probing these um, butanoic acid derivatives that I, that I told you about initially. So initially, these are the ones that very nicely go via a five member polar cycle if, if we use this eight amino quinoline um, directing group to, to give us the, um, the anti-Markovnikov product. And the question we also wanted to answer was kind of, stepping the difficulty up a little bit, can we take these substrates that we know react very well via this five-membered um, palata cycle, and can we force those to go via the six-member palata cycle instead? So in a system where we could access this more favorable five-member, can we force that system to go via the, the, the less stable six-member intermediate instead? And indeed, by adding the tridentate directing group to, to these substrates instead of the bidentate one, we can force them to go via the, the less favorable six-member um, Pallada cycle intermediate to get these, um, these Markovnikov products instead. In the interest of, of full disclosure, the remaining 15% uh, here do go via the, the five member Pallada cycle to give us the, the other uh, regioisomer. So our control isn't perfect here, um, but simply the fact that we can take um, a thermodynamically and, and uh, kinetically really stable system and, and force that to go via the what was so far thought to be the, the thermodynamically and, and kinetically less favorable pathway to us was, was already really exciting. Um, and the reason we think that, that we can do this is if you, um, so, so, so basically the, the question I'm asking here is, why can we, why can we force the system to, to go that way? Why do these tridentate directing groups seem to favor the, the six member Pallada cycle? And we think that the reason for this is that you're decreasing steric strain and ring strain in the Pallada cycle intermediate that you're forming. So we have a square planar palladium center, um, and you can already see that the, the chem draw that I've drawn here is, is quite strained. I, I struggle to, to get the structure into, um, into chem drawn and look neat. Um, so we've got, we've got quite a lot of uh, ring strain in this 555 system. And you can also see that the two substituents here, the, the third coordination site that we've introduced and the alkene substrate are very, very close to each other. Um, there's a lot of steric clash there as well. And we think that by opening up one of these um, five membered rings into a six membered ring instead we're releasing some of the ring strain we're releasing some of that steric clash and we believe that that's why we can we can um force the system that would otherwise prefer to go via a five membered inter intermediate to go via the, the six intermediate the six membered intermediate when we use our our tridentate directing groups instead 
So looking a little bit at the, the mechanism of the reaction, I introduced this catalytic cycle to you on the, on the second or third slide, but I just wanted to talk you through a couple of the me mechanistic studies we did to confirm, um, ideally confirm that, that we are, sorry, I've lost my words there, um, that this is indeed the catalytic cycle that is at play in this reaction. So the first step I told you was um, coordination of the directing group to the palladium catalyst to give us this intermediate here where the palladium is coordinated to the, the three coordination sites on our directing group. And we were able to verify that by reacting stoichiometric amounts of palladium acetate with our, with our substrate um, to form this complex. We were then able to crystallize that complex and confirm it by, by X-ray crystallography. Um, Interestingly, this was the complex that we, that we crystallized out. In the case of a bidentate directing group, usually what we can see is the, the complex where the palladium has already coordinated to the alkene ligand. So that suggests that perhaps in the case of a tridentate directing group, ligand exchange is slower than, than in the case of a bidentate directing group. The next thing we did was we took this isolated complex and um, reacted it with, again, the stoichiometric amount of our nucleophile in the hope that we might be able to access um, this six-membered palladocycle intermediate that's crucial to the entire hypothesis in this project. And in the case of bidentate directing groups, the group had done this before and, and had been able to, to isolate uh, similar intermediates, obviously not the six-membered one, but, but similar five-membered intermediates. Um, that required elevated temperatures. Uh, sorry, no, the next step, step required elevated temperatures. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, in the case of a bidentate directing group, the, the group had been able to, to isolate similar intermediates. So we were slightly surprised when in this case, we could never actually isolate or even see by N NMR the six-membered palladocycle intermediate. To me, that was quite disappointing because, as I said, this this is the whole um, linchpin of of this pro product project, and we we really wanted to confirm that we were indeed forming this intermediate. What we saw instead, when we when we took this intermediate over here and treated it with the nucleophile was that we skipped this step and went straight to the proto depalidated product without adding any external acid. Um, and that's where I got ahead of myself. This is the step that requires elevated temperatures in the case of a bidentate directing group. But in this case, using the tridentate directing group, um, this very rapidly occurred even at room temperature. And again, we were able to isolate this complex and confirm it by um, X-ray crystallography. The last thing that then happens in the catalytic cycle is that we get dissociation of the palladium, which can re-enter the catalytic cycle and freeze our, um, our pro product. But coming back to this, to this central intermediate here, which we weren't able to isolate, um, we, we thought about this for a while. And we then came back to the fact that when I was discussing the substrate scope, I told you that all of the nucleophiles that we used, uh, bar one, have this hydroxy group next to the reactive center. So we came up with a new hypothesis. What if proto-depalidation in these cases does not rely on an external source of acid? What if it's the proton in the hydroxy group of the nucleophile that is now bound to our, um, to our complex and is, is therefore um, an intramolecular reaction instead of an intermolecular reaction. What if this is our acid source? And, and what if that is why we can never isolate this intermediate because there's already an acid source in there which, which, which makes this proto-depalidation, it, 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 um, excuse me, it protonates this carbon-palladium carbon bond um, and therefore we, we can't isolate this intermediate. And indeed, um, that is what our computational collaborators at, at Penn State, Yan Yan Wang, carried out the, the calculations, and she was supervised by Professor Peng Liu. And that, that is, this hypothesis was confirmed by them. They show um, that in the case of these tridentate directing groups with, with these um, hydroxycumarin nucleophiles, you can see, uh, you can calculate an interaction between the, the internal hydrogen on that hydroxy bond and um, if, if you if you calculate that you get very rapid and very favorable proto-depalidation 
Indeed, the proto-depalidation is so favorable in that case that it is um, easier to do. It, is, it, is, um, it has a lower activation energy than the competing beta-hydride elimination step. So even though we weren't able to isolate our crucial intermediate here, calculations by our collaborators confirmed um, that it is reasonable to assume that we are going via this um, six member polar cycle based on their calculations. And it, also, it is also reasonable to, to assume that we get this um, intramolecular proto-depolidation, which is energetically more favorable than the beta hydride elimination that we were trying to, trying to suppress. So this was really nice for us to see because it con confirms the hypothesis that we had going into this project that by designing these pincer-like tridentate directing groups, we can block the vacant site on the methyl, therefore suppress competing beta hydride elimination and access these, these products that we, that we set out to get at the very beginning. And this is just a quick summary slide. Um, summarizing what I, what I just told you there, the problem that we were trying to solve in the beginning was, can we extend the substrate scope of our transformations to, um, to substrates with a slightly longer carbon backbone? The problem that we had to overcome here was that the six-membered intermediate, paladocycle intermediate, that the, that the reaction would proceed through was very unstable compared to the thermodynamically and kinetically more favored five-membered paladocycle and we managed to suppress the competing, competing beta hydride elimination reactions by designing these tridentate directing groups that block the vacant site on the metal. And I alluded to, to why we're excited about this in one of the previous slides, um, because if we design new directing groups that allow us to, to do this kind of chemistry, we can not only extend the substrate scope, but we can also use uh, one, sorry, use uh, one substrate one specific alkene, and then depending on which directing group we tag onto that alkene, um, we can do regiodivergent, regiodivergent functionalization to selectively get either the Markovnikov product using the tridentate directing group or the anti-Markovnikov product using the bidentate directing group. So that's, uh, that kind of wraps up this project. And then what I'd like to spend the, the last couple of minutes on is um, wh what's going to happen next in, in my group. And I'm, I'm very excited to have started this project that I'm trying to summarize in just one slide here. Um, but basically the, the project that I just told you about looked at designing new directing groups to stabilize um, palladium species that might otherwise be too unstable to access. In this project, what I'd like to do is I'm taking inspiration from um, hypervalent iodine chemistry. There's a lot of really exciting chemistry out there using diaryl iodonium salts, um, which can be used for relatively simple oxidations. They can be used as electrophilic aerolating agents for late stage functionalization of, for example, drug targets. Um, and they also solved one of the big problems in um, the radio labeling of aromatic um, medical imaging probes. So for a long time, it was very difficult to, to, um, to radio label electron rich aromatic rings with fluoride. Obviously fluoride is, is a nucleophilic source. Um, and these electrophilic diaryl iodonium salts were able to, to circum circumvent this or, or, or to solve this longstanding problem, um, giving access to a lot of interesting new medical imaging probes for positron emission tomography. So that's, that's the background, that's the known literature with these, um, with these known diaryl iodonium salts. The thing that's not very known in the literature is, can we take one of these aromatic substituents and exchange them for an alkyl substituent as, as well, which I hope will then be able to extend all this interesting chemistry that we can do with diaryl iodonium salts to, to alkyl groups as well. We could develop new electrophilic alkylating agents. Um, my hope is that they will be possibly safer to, to handle than some of the currently available ones because um, by by all accounts, um, the, these compounds should be stable crystalline solids. Um, we could possibly do really interesting transformations that are difficult to do in MedChem at the moment, like, like for example, um, ether formation. And we could use these compounds to do uh, radio labeling of alkyl fluoride traces for, for medical imaging.
So, so that's the, 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 the big goal that I have, but the, I don't want to call it a problem. Let's call it the, the challenge here is that these alkaliodonium species are very unstable, quite similar to the, to the palladium species I've, I've just been telling you about. So I'd like to use some of the um, some of the insight and some of the experience I've gained in designing stabilizing groups to hopefully design stabilizing groups that will allow us to access these hypervalent hypervalent iodine compounds, um, which would then, as I just mentioned, open up this whole um, this this whole exciting chemistry that we could that we could do with them. There's also um, an indication. There's also indications in the literature that these transformations um, that could could work in a catalytic manner, which would obviously be interesting because that would make them a lot more atom efficient than, than using stoichiometric amounts of these reagents. And um, that's that's what we're working on at the moment. Um, we've I've just had a, a PhD student starting in the lab this October, um, look, looking at this project. Um, very excitingly for for me, I've just had funding come through for a three year postdoc position. So if if any of the chemistry I told you about today, and in particular this chemistry, sounds interesting to you. Um, keep an eye out. I'm, I'm just waiting for the last bit of paperwork to come through, and then I'll I'll put the the job out for this this postdoc out. Um, probably starting somewhere between April or, or July next week. Um, I'll I'll advertise that um, on on my website. I'll, I'll also advertise it on on uh, jobs.ac.uk. The the other interesting thing that's happening at the moment is. Um, the deadline for this is, is very soon, but we've got a doctoral training center in, in Nottingham on sustainable chemistry, and we're currently advertising a project looking at the development of thermoelectric materials, so materials that can transfer heat into electricity. If that's something that sounds uh, interesting to you or, or one of the undergraduate students that we know, we're currently advertising PhD positions in, in this CDT. So I apologize for using all this time for, to, to advertise um, my group, but I, I'd obviously also like to thank all of the people that did all of the, all of the hard work that I showed you there. Um, my mentors, uh, Veronique Gouverneur was my PhD advisor and then, and then Kiri Engel was my postdoc supervisor. Um, all of the staff and students that I've worked with at Galway and now at Nottingham, the funding bodies that have funded my research so far. Um, this was our Christmas dinner yesterday evening. Um, we we braved the uh, <laughs> the COVID infested waters. I uh, did lots of tests beforehand, obviously, and it, that that's not my my entire group. We share we share a lab space with the with with Liam Ball's group here at Nottingham. Um, so so my group is is kind of the the initiative. The, the, um, the, the first couple of people on, on this photo. And then obviously I'd like to thank you all um, for the opportunity to speak here and for your, for your kind attention during my talk. And I'd be very happy to take any questions from you. Sorry, they're just coming back online, uh, getting the camera sorted. No problem at all. I'm impressed Sorry, how well did... this uh, this hybrid event is working. Yes, did, did. Uh, Thank you. My question would be, have you ever considered using different ligands on palladium rather than the directing groups? Is a functionalizing the alkenes. And I'm struck by collagen carbonylation chemistry, where that uh, stability of five or six membrane grain governs the perfectly alternating polyketones, for instance. So I wonder if you do the ligands chemistry rather than the directing group chemistry. Yeah, that, that's a really good question because um, I, I think the entire field is trying to move away from directing groups and, and more towards ligands um, because one of the downsides of directing groups is getting rid of them after, after the successful transformation. And I just have a slide to show that here. Um, the conditions you have to use to get rid of some of these directing groups can be quite, quite harsh. Um, which isn't really what you want after you've spent all this time and effort to, to functionalize your complex molecule. You don't then want to 
boil it up in acid overnight, which sometimes is, is what you need to do to get rid of these directing groups. So yes, absolutely, you're, you're correct in saying that the field is trying to move more towards um, using ligands to carry out these, these transformations. Um, you mentioned polyketides. One of the ligand classes that have been shown to be very, um, very effective in, in these types of, of transformations are um, amino acid, acid derivatives. That's, that's one of the reasons we tried an amino acid derivative of, of our directing group. Um, but yeah, I, I completely agree mm -hmm. that that's something that the field is moving towards. And um, later work in Curie Engels group has moved towards using ligands rather than directing groups to carry out some of these functionalizations. Good, thank you. More questions from in the room? Oh yes, one up right at the back there. Uh, hi. Um, with regards to the six members uh, being mentioned in the time of isolation, because the hydrogen from the alcohol was uh, accelerating the process past that step, have you tried using uh, an alcohol side salt or adding a bulky uh, base and a carbon sponge to uh, try and blend that step to the back step? So I was sorry, I really struggled to, to understand your question there. The, the, the microphone quality wasn't that great. Can you just repeat that again? Well, why don't you come forward? Perhaps it was the problem with the audio. Um, so with, with regards to the, the catalytic cycle, you had the alcohol that was acting as the acid and um, pushing it past, so you didn't isolate it underneath it. Um, did you use like an alcohol side salt to a sodium? So to to deprotonate the alcohol and therefore and therefore isolate the intermediate. That's a really good question. I I must admit I hadn't considered that. Um, but yeah, that that might have given us that that might have stabilized the the complex enough to to prevent that that protonation. I really like that idea. It's not something we thought of at the time. Good, thank you. Any more questions from within the room? If not, we'll see if we've got any that are coming online. Josie? We've got lots online. Um, Michael asks, um, what is the role of the 0.5 equivalent of acetic acid in your reactor mixture if your protein source is the NUH? Could it cause the protonation of any of the coordinated groups proposed in your mechanism? For example, the alkene group. Again, that, that's a really good question. Um, my, we, we didn't do much research on this. My, my feeling is that it might um, accelerate the, the, the protonation. Um, I don't think it would protonate the double bond. One thing we didn't try was running the reaction with, without the addition of acid um, because it, it took us quite long to, we, we did these mechanistic studies at the, at the end of the project, um, at which point I, I guess we could have taken a step back and, and tried the reaction without addition of external acid if, if we've got the internal acid um, helping us along. As I said, my feeling is that it might speed up the process, but I don't have any, I don't have any data backing that up. Good, thank you. Another, uh, more questions, Josie? So Sarah Vanner asks, was there any change in the bite angle to justify the pincer effect within the bidentate and tridentate ligands? Also a very interesting question. <laughs> the the bite, bite angle of the, these ligands, I must confess, is not something that we looked at. We do have the, the crystal structures, so I guess we could dig into that, for, into that information. Um, what we do see in the crystal structures is the, the tridentate coordination. Um, we, we have confirmed that by, by X-ray crystallography that we we do indeed have coordination to all three sites of the directing group. Um, if, if we go to the computational studies, um, one of the reasons our compu computational collaborators think that the, the beta hydride el elimination was quite high in energy compared to proto-depolidation is because you need to get partial 
dissociation of the of the directing group to free up that vacant center on the metal and and start your beta hydride elimination. Um, so both of those results, the the X-ray crystal data and the computational data, suggest that we do indeed have. Uh, three coordination centers to, to the ligand. Um, but I must admit the, the bite angle is, is not something that we looked into, even though we we do have the, the X-ray crystallography data. Good, thanks. Another question, Josie? Um, so Chris Newman asks, would the four would four methoxycumarin, i.e. no internal OH proton, enable you to isolate the tridentate intermediate, or do the methoxy groups on the nucleophile cause it to not react. I don't believe that's one of the nucleophiles that we tried. I can go to the full. Uh, no, we didn't. We didn't attempt any um, coordination on the on the coumarin. Um, we had we we had a couple of. Um, Heteroaromatics that that didn't cause the reaction to stop. So, I, so I presume the addition of the of the methoxy group wouldn't cause us any issues. Um, so again, yeah, I, I like all of the uh, all of the ideas to to try and isolate up that intermediate. I'll, I'll definitely make make notes of those. Um, thank you. Not something we tried, but but I presume definitely worth doing. I don't know if the um, if that hydroxy group is not only important for the internal protonation. Um, if we go back, back to the, the catalytic cycle, I wonder whether it's also important to increase the the nucleophilicity of that carbon center. Um, so we'd have to we'd have to see whether. I assume that, that that's why you suggested the methoxy group to, to try and push some more electron density towards that towards that carbon center. Um, I don't I don't know if, if that would be enough or if if maybe that would make the, the, the carbon less nucleophilic. Um, but yeah, certainly. As I said, I, I like all of these ideas. Thank you. Good. I think we can take a final question if there is one. Okay. Uh, I think I think the next one is also more of possibly a suggestion. Um, but uh, Howard von Koten says thank you for the lecture. It's excellent, and um, suggests using a supported directing group could solve the need for separation afterwards. A solid supported directing group on the. Sorry, can you can you clarify what you mean by that? Um, let me just. Well, I think maybe we'll we'll have to deal with this by correspondence. Yes, I'm. That, it sounds like a really good idea. I'm I'm happy to to chat more about it on in in the chat function. So I've I've, I've allowed her to talk. So if he wants to unmute himself, he could ask. Oh, we can type it into the chat. Um, I'm assuming you will ask in the chat then. I suggest you deal with this by kind of email correspondence, if that's if that's okay. Um, and sorry if, if there are other questions that we don't have time to take. Uh, but could I conclude this session by thanking Miriam for a really very interesting talk, very stimulating, and evident from the large number of questions. So thank you very much, Miriam.